Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Built to Last, and we're learning how to build a successful marriage and family. Join us today to discover an essential ingredient for a successful family. The lesson is called, How Firm is Your Foundation? kid, my brothers and sisters and I, especially my little sister and my older sister, we were the three younger kids and the three older kids, there were six in my family, so there was kind of a natural break, and so the three younger kids kind of did a lot together, and we would watch... Uh, a lot of Walt Disney together when I was a kid, and there would be various uh, movies that would come on from Walt Disney that were just classics, you know, things like Beauty and the Beast and Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I mean, those when those came on, it was just like you're glued to that. It, this is long before the days of uh, videotape and DVDs and all that stuff. It was just like whatever's on TV, whatever's at the movie theater, that's what you got. And you know, those classic famous stories, the Snow Whites and Cinderella's and, and Sleeping Beauties, they all kind of they were a love story. It, was, it had adventure and it had excitement, but it all ended did the same where the girl and the guy met and fell in love and got married and they lived happily ever after. That's, that's how they all ended and they lived happily ever after. Now, most of us, we like stories with happy endings. You know, we love the and they lived happily ever after, but we say, yeah, but that's a fairy tale. That's a fairy tale. But, but see, all of us, when we go into marriage, we have in our minds, this is gonna be like that. I'm gonna be different from everybody else. My parents might have had a bad marriage and, and her parents might have had a bad marriage and everybody I know might have not gotten along that well, but we're gonna have a great marriage because we love each other and we're gonna live happily ever after. I think it was Florence Littower who wrote the book after every wedding comes the marriage. And that's so true, right? The, the wedding is kind of like, and they lived happily ever after, and they throw rice at you, and uh, you know, that, that's just so euphoric, and you go on your honeymoon. But after every marriage, uh, every wedding comes the marriage, comes real life, comes the four kids uh, under the age of three, and, and the uh, difficulties and things like that. And many people don't handle real life very well. And so in marriage, in family, when things get tough, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. They want to get out. And if it doesn't work out, they bail out and they say, I don't want this anymore. I want to start over and find my fairy tale spouse. Well, fairy tale spouses don't exist. They don't exist. Hey, we're starting a new series today called Built to Last. It's how to have a successful, how to build a successful marriage and a successful family. Now, a successful marriage, a successful family isn't a family, isn't a marriage that doesn't ever have trouble because everybody has trouble. It's real life. How in real life can you build a marriage and a family that not only survives but thrives? One that really experiences love and joy and peace. That's not a pipe dream. That's not a fairy tale. That's what God wants to infuse in every marriage and into every family. Those are the things that come from God, love and joy and peace. And he wants that for you and your family and your marriage. He wants that in spades. So we're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead, how to build a family like that, how to build a family, a marriage that can last and stand the test of time. Well, to kick us off, we're gonna be in Psalm 127 in a message I've entitled, How Firm is Your Foundation? 
This is Psalm 127. It's a psalm attributed to Solomon. It's a song of ascents, which means that the Jews, when they would make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they had to do that three times a year for the great feasts. And as they would ascend the hill of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is on a hill, they would sing these particular psalms. They were called psalms of ascent as they would ascend the hill of Jerusalem. And this is one that speaks about the family. It says, unless the Lord... Yahweh builds the house. They labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. God is pro-family. God is pro-marriage. And God wants to bring a man and a woman together in holy matrimony and bless them and have them build a home that stands the test of time, a home that is filled with love and joy and peace. And children, when they come into that home, they're a gift from God. The fruit of the womb, it's not a penalty, it's a reward. So here's our question for today. Hey, what does it take to have a successful marriage and family? What does it take to have a happy home? Three key ingredients. Ingredient number one. It takes the right home builder. You're gonna have a happy home. You're gonna have a successful marriage and family. It takes the right home builder. Listen to it again. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Now, how many in this room have ever gone through uh, the situation of buying a plot of land and getting with a builder and having that builder build you a house. Anybody in this room, you've had that experience? Uh, many of us. I, I, Debbie and I never have. We've always just bought a house that's already been made. But my brother had a house. He had a builder, and he had him make that. And my brother's an attorney, and his wife's an attorney. And the builder wanted to, to slash his wrists after working with them because, you know, everything just had to be so, and there was always the threat of lawsuit, and it was, it was just awful. I hope he's not watching this. But uh, Anyway, you know how it is. I mean, most builders and doctors and people like that, they don't really like to work on lawyers because there's always the, the threat there. Uh, but it, he hired, my brother Larry, he hired a builder. Now, the scripture says, makes it very clear, when it comes to not constructing a house with brick and mortar, but constructing a home, a family with love and trust and peace and joy, you and I don't have what it takes. We're not able to build the house. We're not able to build the family. We're not able to do it. Unless the Lord does it, they labor in vain who try to build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. You can't build your home, you can't protect your home, you can't provide for your home in terms of a loving, joyous, God-blessed family. You can't do it. You don't have it within you to do it. Now, it, it says here that it is vain. Three times God says that. It is vain, it is vain, it is vain. That word vain means to be useless, to be empty, to be worthless, now, your, your labor and all your sweat and toil and hard work, it's just useless. God says it's worthless. It's never going to happen because you can't do it on your own. I love the word labor here in the Hebrew. It means to toil, to work severely with irksomeness. I thought that was interesting. To work severely with irksomeness. Oh, what does that mean, irksomeness? We don't really use that word irksome uh, very much, but it means to be annoyed. 
It means to, to get ticked off, to be exasperated, to be in disagreement. That describes real life in marriage. Your spouse will make you annoyed from time to time. I, I am very gifted at annoying my wife. It's just, I, don't, I just have the ability to do that. Uh, I love to use her name in songs. Uh, Debbie doesn't like to be called Deb. Uh, you know how some people just take it upon themselves to shorten somebody's name? And so she'll introduce herself to somebody and say, yeah, I'm Debbie. Oh, hi, Deb. I'm not Deb. She's thinking this. She doesn't say it. I'm not Deb. I'm Debbie. I'm glad you feel the comfort. We've known each other now for five seconds to feel the comfort to just come up with a new name for me. So I love to use the name Deb in songs. I just stick her name in that. And it just drives her crazy, for instance. I like KHCB Radio 92.5, and they have a lot of old songs on there. So I will sing to her, how... Can Deb say thanks for the things that he has done for Deb? Things so undeserved, yet he gave to prove his love for Deb. The voices of a million angels could not express Deb's gratitude. (laughs) All that Deb is and ever hopes to be, Deb owes it all to thee. And I just do that over and over, and I can pick all sorts of songs. And it drives her insane. And you know what she'll say to me sometimes? She'll say, listen, I I hear your song, okay? I need Big Jeff right now. (laughs) Seventh grade Jeff has been a lot of fun, but let's have Big Jeff. And she would be the first to tell you, I can be so irksome in our relationship. Now I never do it to be mean, I do it to be fun, but I can take fun past the point of, I'm going to shoot you now, you know? <laughs> um, but that, that's kind of marriage, and, and uh, you know, in, in our marriage, I was always, in, in our family, I was always the fun one, and Debbie was the structured one in our family. And the girls, they loved dad because dad was fun, but they clung to mom because mom made things go. We would sometimes say, girls, if something terrible happened and and one of us were gone, which one would you want that to be? Dad, we love you, but we can't live without mom. I mean, (laughs) so I just understood that because they needed structure. I remember one of them said, well, gosh, if mom were gone, who would do my hair? I was like, well, not me. I'm not going to do that. So so they knew. But but here it is. You, You and I don't have what it takes because the other person is going to irk you. And no matter how much you strive and no matter how much you sweat and no matter how much labor, the Lord says you can't build it. But good news, he can build it. He can build it. So he, the Lord, is the one who can build a happy home. Unless the Lord builds the house, And that word unless has this idea of, of course, truly, surely, unless he does it, it's not going to get done. Here's the thing about Jesus. He is the Lord. Know that the Lord himself is God. And as I said before I started this message, that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Psalm 100, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The Lord is God. And Jesus, the Lord God, before he started his public ministry, he was a carpenter and he built things and he built stuff and he built tables and he built chairs and he built plows and he built carts. He's a builder and and, and he's still in the building business. The song says, Jesus is a carpenter from Nazareth, from Galilee, and he's doing a construction job inside of me. Didn't leave his work when he went away because I can see him working in my life each day. And he is working in a Christian's life, and he's working in a couple's life. He wants to work in a couple's life to build their home. See, Jesus is building, as he told the disciples, he's building a heavenly home. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. 
What kind of a place is the Lord building for us? A, a heavenly home that's just gonna blow our minds. What eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has even entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So he's building us a heavenly home. He's building our church home because he said in Matthew chapter 16, upon this rock, speaking of himself, upon this rock, I will build my church. Building a heavenly home for us, his children. Building a church home for his children. And he wants to build your family home, if you will let him. But now here's something you need to remember. Jesus doesn't just build for anybody. I, I have some friends in our church who are builders, build custom homes. But they're, they're kind of uh, getting out of that business because they're uh, getting on in years and they're kind of entering into retirement. And so when Debbie and I were looking at houses and thinking about, well, maybe we should buy some property and, and, and build, well, I wonder if, if one of those guys would build for us. And so talking to them, they said, well, you know, I, I don't really build for anybody anymore, but I do build for friends, for friends, family and friends. You know, that's the way the Lord does it. He says, I'm not gonna build for anybody. I'll only build for friends. And here's the thing. Jesus will only build for friends and he wants you to be one of his friends. He won't build for anybody, just a friend. And he says, and if you would like me to build for you, then become my friend. And let's become best friends because those are the ones I build for, best friends. Hey, what does it take to have a successful marriage and family, to have a happy home? It takes ingredient number one, the right home builder. It takes ingredient number two, the right foundation. You get the right builder, think in terms of a physical home. You get the right builder, and then you, have a, a, you find the right plot of land. And if you don't have the right plot of land, a, a wise builder will say, well, I can't build there. That, that soil's not right. That, that foundation uh, where, where I would put the house, that's not any good. No, that won't work. We can't build that because that's on a slippery slope. That's on the side of a hill. That, that won't work there. You gotta find a better plot of land because foundation is critical to any home. Everybody knows that. Perhaps you're familiar with a couple named Robert and Denise Webb. They bought a house in 2012 that was right on the lake. It had been built in 2007. They did all their due diligence, or so they thought, and they thought they had a wonderful home. It was 4,000 square feet right there on the water. It cost them $700,000. Here's a picture of that house, just a beautiful house. Looks so good, but after just less than a year and a half, this is what happened to the house. The foundation began to give way underneath the house. That house on Lake Whitney was burned up and dropped into the lake because it was such a hazard and such a peril. They didn't wait for it to totally fall down into the lake. They sped up the process. The webs couldn't get any insurance to pay them. They said, that's not on us, that's on you. They ate the 700,000 and you know what? Then they had to pay to clean it up. Ouch. Well, what happened in that scenario? They didn't choose a good foundation. Now, it's not on them, they didn't really know, but you would have to say that house was not built on a solid, sure foundation because it didn't even last seven years. So what is the right foundation in marriage? We get the right builder, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's the right foundation where we go with the builder to find the right foundation? The right foundation in marriage and family is the word of God. You and I must build on God's word. Jesus made that so clear when he told the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. And he said this, the wise man built his house upon the rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and it burst against the house built on the rock and the house built on the rock stood because it was founded on the rock. But when the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against the house that was built on the poor foundation that was built on the sand, it fell and great was its fall. And then Jesus says this, 
Therefore, Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Now, I want you to circle two words on your outline. Everyone who hears these words of mine, circle hears, and then he says, and acts upon them, circle acts. See, it's not enough just to hear the Lord's word. You have to do what he says. You have to act upon it. That's what it means to build on God's word. You hear his word, you hear what he says, you hear his commandments, and you act upon them. You do them. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 17, that you are blessed not if you hear his commandments, but if you do his commandments. Doing makes all the difference in the world. And you and I must build on God's word. And furthermore, you and I are fools if we hear and we don't obey. That's what the the foolish builder did. He heard, but he didn't obey. And Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act upon them will be like a fool who built his house upon the sand. Both, Both groups heard the same message. One did it, one didn't. That's what it's like in church. That's what it's like when people come to church. They hear the same message. Some go away and say, I am going to obey the Lord. I am going to do what he says. And others go and they say, yeah, I heard that. That was a good message. I hope so-and-so was here to hear that. And you walk away and you don't do it. Hey, hey, If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them, not if you know them. You're blessed if you do them. Now, why? Think about this. Why would someone hear the Lord's words, the Lord who loves them, the Lord who created them, the Lord who knows everything about everything, the Lord who knows the right way to go, the Lord who wants to bless For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. God says, that's the way I want you to go, where there's a future, where there's a hope, where there are good things. And you say, yeah, but I don't, I'm going to go my own way, because I I have this this other way figured out, Lord, and it's, it's a whole lot more fun to go my way than it is to go your way. Well, the problem with going your way is you end up like the webs. You might have a a nice structure, but it's built on a faulty foundation, and one day, it's going to crash. One day, the storm is going to blow it off its foundation, because its foundation is sand, and it's not stable. Hey, why do people choose their way over God's way? I mean, I'll give you some examples. People come to church and, and they hear that, well, you know, uh, you need to spend time with the Lord. Every single day, have a quiet time. People listen to that, they hear it, and they say, yeah, I don't have time for that. That's good for somebody else. I just, I'm, I'm busy. I'm a busy guy, busy uh, lady. I don't have time for that. Quiet time, don't have time. They hear about giving and how important it is to honor the Lord from your wealth. Ah, can't afford that. So I don't have time for a quiet time, can't afford to give They hear about serving and plugging in and how it's so important to to, uh, give back and to serve other people. Well, I don't want to do that. You know, I'm just, I'm a busy guy, so I don't have time for a quiet time. I don't have time to help other people. I don't have time to serve other people. And I sure don't, can't afford to give. And even if I can afford to give, I just don't want to give. And so they do their own thing. And they go their own way. And they think that God should just bless them for doing whatever they want to do. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. You do whatever you want to do. You're free to do whatever you want to do. But there are consequences to doing whatever you want to do. And if you want to experience the goodness and the blessing of God at home, then you have to start doing what God says. There are two verses in the book of Proverbs that are worth memorizing. Proverbs 14, 12, and Proverbs 16, 25. You only have to memorize it one time because it's the same verse that's recorded in Proverbs 14, 12, and Proverbs 16, 25. It says this, there is a way 
that seems right to a man. But its end is the way of death. You go your way, the Lord will let you do that. You hear and you don't act upon his words and you build on sand and you think it's wonderful and it's hunky-dory and it's like the webs. Hey, look at our new house. We bought it in 2012 and here it is. We're gonna have a big housewarming and everyone say, says, what a wonderful, beautiful house right there on the water. And they come back a year and a half later and it's being demolished because the foundation was no good. Hey, it takes the right home builder. It takes the right foundation. And thirdly and finally, it takes the right watchman. The right watchman. Verse one, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Now, it seems like the Lord switches gears from uh, the house to the city, but the word city can be translated town, and it's really a city, a town is a collection of homes. The word city could also be translated the inner room. It's a place guarded by a watchman. And, and the, the city would have people on the, the towers watching out for it at night just to make sure everything was safe. And, and I think the Lord is, he's still speaking of the family, he's still speaking of the home here, and he's saying, hey, you need someone to watch over this. And just as you're not able to build your home, you're not able to keep your home. Because the word guards means to protect, it means to keep. It means to build a hedge of protection around. And that's what the Lord does, and you and I aren't able to do that. See, we, we can't build our home, we can't provide for our home. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful lab labors. That doesn't work. It's just vain. It's empty. It's meaningless. And you can't watch over your home. The, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Now, why do I need God not only to build my home, my family, my marriage, but God to watch over my home, my family, my marriage? It's because of this. There is an adversary outside the home. His name is the devil, and 1 Peter chapter 5 says that the devil is, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's outside the gate. He's outside your property line. He's prowling around. He's walking around. When I was in Africa some years ago, we went on a safari for two days. We left the mission field and took a break and, and went on safari, and we were at the Mari Safari uh, Park, and it was a, an awesome place. And you're just right out there, boom, in the, in the jungle with all the animals, and you have an electric fence around you. And it's a good thing because when we went out early uh, that morning to look at animals right outside the gate, of the electric fence, we saw two lions. Now, I wouldn't have slept very well in my tent had there not been a gate because I wouldn't have felt very protected. Well, the devil is like that lion. He's, he's prowling around, looking, and ready to pounce on whom he may devour. He's looking for an opening. He's looking for a crack in the wall, so to speak. And the scripture says, you're not able to see him. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen keep awake in vain. See, the devil is lurking, and he wants to destroy your home. Jesus said of the devil, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the devil's plan, to steal from you, to kill you, to destroy you and everyone you know. You know, we've heard about the Terminator, as in the old movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which they're making another one, I heard, I mean, Arnold is, hats off to you, Terminator. I mean, you're an old dude now. But uh, what they said about the Terminator, I've never forgotten this. In the very first Terminator movie, the, the guy is trying to tell Sarah Connor, he says, listen, you don't get it. He will never stop. He will just keep coming and coming and coming at you. He has no compassion. He doesn't care about anything. He is just there to destroy you. That's the devil. 
He didn't ever take a break. He didn't get tired. He is prowling around seeking someone to devour. And you're not able to stand up to him. But the Lord is. The Lord is greater as he who is in you than he who is in the world. So he's lurking, wants to destroy your home. Now, let me just give you very quickly some ways that the devil destroys your home because he's looking for cracks to get in through the wall, to get into your home, to, bring ha- to wreak havoc and destroy your marriage and destroy your family. First one, first thing he uses to destroy your home, drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol will destroy a home. And everyone in this room who has experienced that in the home, whether it's mom, whether it's dad, whether it's the kids, getting into drugs and alcohol, you know that it, it, it's like experiencing hell on earth. It's awful. It's awful. I had a small taste of that when I was a kid growing up because I, I had that in my family, and it was awful. The fighting that comes from that and the unrest and, and that man, as a, as a 10-year-old boy, it's just, it's just a nerve-wracking, oh man, what's going on here type deal. You know what's sad is that so many people, they don't think much of it, especially with alcohol, they don't think much of it. What do they do? At the wedding, in so many weddings, they have the toast and they lift up the glass of alcohol to say, this is what our home, let's just celebrate with alcohol. For so many, that's the thing that will destroy their marriage, that will destroy their family. My attitude toward drugs and alcohol is stay away from it. Stay away from it. You're never gonna have a problem with that stuff destroying your home if you don't ever open the door there. So that's one of the ways that the devil works through drugs and alcohol. Second way he works to destroy, sexual immorality. Boy, you, that, that's an open door if you have sexual immorality in your marriage. Pornography is a huge problem for men and now for women. And it's, it's just a, a portal for the devil to come in and wreak all kinds of havoc and set up all kinds of strongholds in your mind. And you can't feed on that stuff for very long before you get very sick. It's like drinking out of the sewer. And so many couples are dealing with that. And listen, is there victory in that? Landon Huffer shared just a few weeks ago that he struggled with that and God gave him victory and continues to give him victory as Landon continues to walk with the Lord and work that out with his wife. And I praise God for that. That was a strong testimony and that speaks to so many people because so many people are struggling with that stuff. And you think it's no big deal. It's a huge deal and it will wreck and ruin your life. It'll wreck and ruin your family. I don't think I need to say about adultery, how what adultery does to the family, what adultery does to the marriage. You wanna torpedo your marriage, you commit adultery. It's like dropping an A-bomb on it. Doesn't mean you can't recover from that, but man, it's hard. And the pain that it brings into the home. Oh, the devil works through that stuff, through drugs and alcohol, through sexual immorality. How about this one? He uses unresolved conflict to destroy your home. That's when you have a fight and you never resolve it. You have an issue and you never work it out. You just sweep it under the rug. We live in a generation that that's just what they want to do. They just want to sweep it under the rug. They want to send send retail and confess wholesale and just say, oh yeah, I'm sorry, and just sweep it under the rug. They have this major fight, uh, husband and wife, and then uh, the husband's too proud to humble himself and apologize to his wife, so he just... uh, You know, they just don't talk for a day or two and then they just go back like nothing ever happened. You can't do that. You gotta deal with it. You gotta gotta work through the issue. The scripture says this, Ephesians chapter four, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. If you let the sun go down on your anger, See, not all anger is wrong. You can be righteously angry, but when you do get angry, if you don't deal with that anger and you let the sun go down on that anger and you go to bed mad and one day turns into two days, turns into three days, turns into three weeks where you've never resolved that, that's just an open door for the devil. That's a toehold for the devil. And when the devil gets a toehold, he turns it into a foothold and he turns that into a a stronghold. And he comes and sets up shop in your relationship and he creates such a a, a bitter, tense, cold atmosphere in the home. 
And the kids pick up on it real fast. Man, what's up with mom and dad? They don't, they don't seem to like each other very much. Dinner time is just such a wonderful time where no one's talking, you know? And it's just like, ugh. Have you ever been in somebody's home like that where you could tell that the husband and wife didn't really like each other very much? It's not any fun. And the kids know that and they're just like, this is tense. Can I go eat somewhere else? Can I go hide in the attic? I mean, just anywhere to get away from that. Oh, the devil works in that way. Hey, in, in marriage, you're gonna have conflict. You gotta work it out. And then lastly, how about this one? How about just plain old selfishness? Plain old selfishness. You know, the devil works through our selfishness. Now, you think about the word selfishness. You look at that word, selfishness. Look at the middle part of the word. The middle part of the word is fish. It stinks. Selfishness stinks like fish. And nobody is attracted to a selfish person. You ever, you ever see somebody that's just filled with selfishness and says, oh, I'm just so drawn to you. I just, I just love the fact that it's all about you. And no, we're not drawn to selfish people. We're drawn to selfless people. Now, you know why I told you it's impossible Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. You know why in and of yourself you can never have a home filled with love and joy and peace? Because some of you may be arguing in your mind, well, I, I have a home like that. I came from a home like that. We didn't trust the Lord, but we had a home like that. Let me tell you something. You don't have a home like that. It may appear like that, just like the Webb's house appeared to be a good house until something happened and the foundation fell apart. You cannot have a home filled with love and joy and peace apart from Jesus Christ because apart from Jesus Christ, all you have is self. And self is on the throne and the deeds of self are the deeds of the flesh. And the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, passion, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, disputes, dissensions, factions, jealousy, outbursts of anger drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. It's a horrible uh, list of things that you and I produce from self. But when the Holy Spirit is present, when the Holy Spirit is living on the throne of our lives, it says, but the, deeds, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. That stuff comes from God. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Hey, it takes the right watchman, and you and I need to live sold out to Jesus Christ every single day. How do you have a good marriage? You sell out to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Jesus, I can't do this thing called marriage and family. I need you, and not only do I need you to build my home, I need you, Lord, to protect my home. I need you to guard my home, and I need to live every day surrendered to you. In the book of the Revelation, the Lord sends a letter to the church in Ephesus, and that church was so good in so many areas, but then Jesus says this in Revelation 2, 4, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Some of you are here, and you know what? If you're honest... And that's the only way to be with God because he sees everything anyway. If you're honest, you'd say, you know what? My marriage is not very going, going very good. My family's not going very good. My kids are not, uh, they're living in a tension-filled home and I don't know what to do to fix it. You go back to Jesus. You come to him, the home builder, the one that will watch, the one that will protect, the one that will provide and you humble yourself before him. And if you're a Christian and you've left your first love, you go back to him. And if you're here and you're an unbeliever and you've never really put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you come to him for the very first time and you cry out in repentance and faith, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he will have mercy on you. And he will restore. And he will pardon. He wants to build your home. He wants to make a difference. He's waiting on you to say yes to him. My friend, if you want a good home and a satisfying life filled with love and joy and peace, listen, it all starts with Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. Now here's the question. Do you know him? 
I mean, really know him, not just in your head, but in your heart. Now, if you're not sure, you can make sure today. Just pray this simple prayer with me and pray it from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Come into my life and change me. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.